Good morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Monday, October 5th, 2020. And tomorrow in history, October 6th, 1787, James Wilson gave a speech that is probably one of the most important pro-Constitution positions given during the ratification period. And if you're like me, you probably were never taught about this in government school at all. You never heard of it until maybe later or maybe even right now. So on this episode, I want to give an overview of what this speech is, why it's important, and some of its key themes. And I'm going to rely primarily on a great new article that we're going to be publishing tomorrow by historian and friend Dave Benner. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 930 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage is where you want to go to find everything you need to follow this show. All the platforms we're on. So if you haven't uh, given us a review on Podbean or iTunes, you can definitely find us there. If you want to think of a different alternative platform rather than YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch or something like that, you can find us on library.tv, Brighteon, BitChute, and elsewhere. All those different platforms that we're on, uh, all the shows, all the episodes in individual shows. So for example, on this show, I'll have some notes where I include a link link to Wilson's speech in whole, and I'm going to link to Dave Benner's overview as, as well. You won't be able to read that till, till that till tomorrow, but it'll all be there for you to research on your own time. And you can even find our membership program where you can support us for as little as two bucks a month, and we make it go a long, long way in support of the Constitution and liberty. That's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And while we're waiting a few more moments for everyone to be able to get notifications for the live show and join us in the live chat, I want to say hello to everyone that I see out here. Well, I'm going to probably miss a few people, but hi to everyone. Thank you for being here. Welcome. I hope you had a great weekend. Bob Landry, Tim Martin, Funky Euphemism, Jeremy Anderson, good to see you. Lawrence Smith in West Virginia, SAH Biochemist, Tyler B., always good to see you, buddy. Brody Scarlett, Clay Kent, happy Monday. Melody Skamen, Shane Lackey, MRGF78, Liberty Howell, Kevin Kamel, break it down, homie, that's awesome. Uh, I think I said Melody and Funky, WC, always good to see you, One Winged Angel. I apologize if I missed anybody, but thank you for being here. Some quick shout outs to Quasar and everyone else. Let's get right to this. And, you know, one thing that I was noticing as I was going through my thoughts on this and reading through Dave's article on this and, of course, rereading Wilson's speech as well, was not only I know how important this was to the people who were considering the Constitution for ratification, but it was never taught anywhere. So I started to look around through some mainstream sources online to see what I could find. And of course, I couldn't find really much. I mean, certainly if you Google and you know what you're looking for, you're going to find a lot of analysis of Wilson and his speech, and you're going to find some history notes as well. But we know that the Philadelphia Convention, where the framers drafted and, and got the uh, Constitution ready for presentation to the people of the several states, that ended on September 17th, 1787. And it was just within a couple of weeks later that Congress said, OK, we're going to send this out to the states. I think it was on September 28th that they uh, sent it out to the states they voted to do that in the Confederation Congress. But if you look at the timeline of the history here, let's look at the Library of Congress. LOC.gov is one of the most mainstream places you can get for the history of the Constitution. And here, where like this page, 1787 to 1788, they give us a timeline, they give us the Constitutional Convention, which really should be called the Philadelphia Convention, the Northwest Ordinance, which I thought was positive. I should cover that at some point. Then Congress gets the, the Constitution, and then from getting the Constitution, we have the Federalist and Anti-Federalist. Nothing else, no Tench Cox, uh, no John Dickinson, no Mercy Otis Warren, no James Wilson. It's just that. But we know that, for example, that the, although the Federalist is incredibly important, we've got Madison, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay, we have to understand the situation at hand, what's going on. Pennsylvania, they knew what the vote was going to be before it happened. And not that there was some conspiracy, it's just that it was a very partisan thing. We have that today. They knew that the vote was going to be in the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention. They expected it to be, I think it was 46 to 23. 
And then when all was said and done, it was 46 to 23. And I'm sure the numbers I have are wrong in my uh, my own brain hard drive here, but they knew what the numbers were going to be, and there was no surprises. In New York State, in Virginia, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, North Carolina, for example, ratification was definitely up in the air. And the Federalist Papers were written primarily directed to a New York audience, and they did not receive wide publication outside of New York State until years later. They were primarily there to convince the people of New York to go against Governor Clinton and the Anti-Federalists and support the Constitution and ratify it. So what were the other documents that were there to convince people to ratify the Constitution around the country? Well, it, according to the Library of Congress, nothing, really. It was just the Federalist. Or here on Wikipedia, you can't get more mainstream than that. September 17th, they tell us the Constitution is signed and the Convention of Jurors. Uh, adjourns. Then on the 18th, it's published. Then it's sent to the Congress on the 20th. And then, of course, we have the early Anti-Federalist Papers. I should cover Cato, for example, at some point on the 27th. Uh, on the 28th, we have Congress, the Confederation Congress, agrees to send it out to the states for ratification. October 5th, the first Anti-Federalist letter by Sentinel is published. On the 8th, Federal Farmer was published. On the 18th, Brutus. And then the Federalist Papers. They totally skip over this. And I know I'm going into a little bit of detail here, but I want to point out how this is just an, an ignored part of history. But if you miss parts of history that the people who lived that history considered very important, then you can't understand what they considered and then approved. So on October 6th, there should be an entry here for October 6th. I will link to this to you guys who are just listening or maybe not reading along with me as I'm scrolling through the video. But uh, on October 6th, they just skipped it over. There should be an entry there for James Wilson's State House Yard speech. Here's an overview from the Liberty Fund where they have it published in full. And they put it this way. Wilson's State House Yard speech was one of the first major public defenses of the proposed Constitution. Uh, I'm probably going to kick myself for saying this, but I think it was really the first one, the first major one and the first one that was widely republished. And it really set the stage for many of the arguments brought up by people later on. And Wilson was a highly respected guy at this point. He was trained by the master lawyer, John Dickinson, in Pennsylvania. Wilson was from Pennsylvania. So by the end of 1787, it had been reprinted. Wilson's speech was reprinted. So he gave it on October 6th. By the end of the year, this is a short amount of time, especially considering transportation and technology of the time, it had been reprinted in 34 newspapers in 12 states out of the 13 and circulated throughout the colonies as a pamphlet. This was highly read, widely understood, and it wasn't written under a pseudonym. They knew it was from James Wilson. He was an arch nationalist, which I'm going to get to in a moment as well. Bernard Balin, one of the probably a very important story, I will say, notes that, quote, in the transient circumstances of the time, it was not so much the Federalist Papers that captured most of people's most people's imaginations as James Wilson's speech of October 6, 1787, the most famous and to some the most notorious Federalist statement of the time. Now, uh, to many of the so-called anti-Federalists, and I, you know, and I'm only going to use those because those are the ones that we know, but we have to make a clarification here. The term anti-Federalist was a propaganda term. It was a term of art. Really, the anti-Federalists were more in support of federalism than the so-called Federalists were. Uh, and a lot of the anti-federalists did not even like that term. I think at some point they just decided to, someone who understands this better, maybe Aaron Coleman or Dave Benner or somebody could put together an article on this at some point. But my understanding is they just kind of took it at some point rather than wasting their time fighting over that term so they could actually make the case to oppose the Constitution. So anyway, so according to Liberty Fund here, this ar article or this uh, reprint of this, they're saying this is one of the most famous public defenses of the Constitution throughout the time. Now, here from Dave Benner, we're not running this till tomorrow, but it's honestly, I think it's one of the best articles, if not the best article, giving an overview of Wilson's speech that I've ever read. And I've looked at this year in and year out for the last few years easily, if not longer. And Dave sums it up pretty much the same way. He says, though the Federalist is often cited by academics 
and federal judges. You'll often see federal judges pointing to federalists. And if you rely on your constitutional argument, not that the federalist is bad, but we have to understand the marketing point of it. If it was really only sold to the people of New York, but it wasn't sold, used to sell people on the Constitution in Virginia and in New Hampshire and in Pennsylvania and in South Carolina and elsewhere, then how much impact does it really have on the original legal meaning of the Constitution? Because the original legal meaning of the Constitution is what the people who gave it legal force understood it to mean, the people of the several states. So Dave points out that academics and federal judges both point out that the Federalist is the definitive commentary on the federal constitution. But the series played only a minor, minor role in securing ratification. The State House Yard speech, that's Wilson's speech of tomorrow in history, on the other hand, framed the way in which friends of the Constitution explained the instrument and answered their many critics. In this way, Wilson's narrative had much more tang had a much more tangible effect on ratification. Now, even just saying this, that does not mean that everything that Wilson said was right or that I agree with everything that Wilson said, or that maybe there were little points in there that he was a little propaganda-y and just overselling things. You can read it yourself and figure that out. I have my own thoughts on that, and I think some of it was garbage, but some of it was really awesome. Um, the point is, is that it had a great impact. It was distributed throughout the country through all 12, through 12 of the 13 states and newspapers and all over the place by pamphlets. So people were influenced this by this heavily. And just a little background, Dave points out that by that time, here it is, 1787, Wilson was an extremely well-known lawyer in Philadelphia. During the imperial crisis with Britain, Dave wrote, Wilson wrote a well-regarded pamphlet that backed the standard patriot notion that Parliament lacked the legal authority to intervene in the internal matters of the colonies. By 1776, Dave goes on, he had become an advocate for colonial independence within a delegation in the Continental Congress that was wholly divided on the issue. So he was a leading advocate for independence. He, John Adams, and others. And mind you, Wilson was one of only six, I think it was six people, to have signed both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution for the United States. I'm not sure where he was on the, uh, on the articles, but uh, this is kind of a big deal. He was very, very well known and very well respected, even by people who thought he was notorious and disagreed with him. He was also nominated, as I've mentioned in recent episodes, he was nominated to have the third seat, I believe, number three, on the Supreme Court. So he was a highly respected legal mind. He was nominated by President George Washington. So let's go right to the beginning of Wilson's speech. And he points out that people asked him, people asked him to give this speech because they wanted their, okay, so it had just been released. This is a very short time. October 6th is right after uh, the, the Philadelphia Convention was done and it was just days after Congress actually sent, decided to send it to the states. And there were already opposition pamphlets and articles being published. So people reached out to Wilson, said, you, you know how to do this. Put this together, come out, give a speech. And who knows if they had plans to actually republish it, but it was so well received. There's tons of applause, all the reports and the writing of the time. People were very, it was very well received there at the state house. And this is how Wilson started. Having received the honor of an appointment to represent you in the late convention, it is perhaps my duty to comply with the request of many gentlemen whose characters and judgment I sincerely respect and who have urged that this would be a proper occasion to lay before you any information which will serve to explain and elucidate the principles and arrangements of the Constitution that has been submitted to the, cons for, to the consideration of the United States. Now, mind you, this was primarily directed to an audience in Pennsylvania, because Pennsylvania was going to be the first state to convene a ratifying convention. They weren't the first to ratify, I believe Delaware was, and then Pennsylvania didn't ratify until sometime in December, but they were getting ready to convene the ratification events and they already had planned it out. And so here he is explaining, this is what's going on. So going further, the first thing that he covers, the number one thing, and if you heard my episodes, 
on the history and impact the I did like three to five episodes on the origination of the Tenth Amendment. I go back to the ratifying debates and I point out that ratification was almost ready to fail until in Massachusetts. And a lot of people will cite Virginia as the most important state pro ratification. I actually think it was Massachusetts. Massachusetts was ready to vote it down. If great revolutionaries, where you have people like Samuel Adams, John Hancock, and others, if they said no, it was very likely that Virginia and others were going to say no, and the whole thing was going to fail. The, re the way that they got it to pass in Massachusetts was they convinced Hancock and Adams to vote yes with the agreement that they were going to propose or suggest amendments that were going to be passed later on. And the first one of these is something that became the Tenth Amendment. So the division between federal and state power was an incredibly divisive and important issue. And it was the only way they got it to pass in Massachusetts. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because Wilson basically lays that framework as well as the first thing that he covers in his important speech of October 6, 1787. He says, it will be proper, however, before I enter into the refutation of the charges that are alleged to mark the leading discrimination between the state discrimination between the state constitutions and the constitution of the United States. So he's pointing out there is a division and he points out that the style of delegated and reserve power is far different. Now I talked about this when we're talking about so-called local sanctuaries in Virginia and elsewhere late last year, you can't address a state level law the same way that you use strategies to deal with the feds because of the structure of the constitution. So they put it out this way when it comes or this is how Wilson put it when it comes to state governments under state constitutions, he says they invested their representatives, which with every right and authority, which they did not in explicit terms reserve. So he's explaining that state constitutions, the way the framework, at least at that time was, if they did not explicitly say you're, you don't have authority to do this, we're reserving to the people. They can do basically whatever and whenever. But he points out that the federal constitution, and this is an important difference for people to understand right off the bat if they're considering this and concerned about state and federal power. He says, but in delegating federal powers, another criterion was necessarily introduced. And the congressional authority is to be collected not from tacit implication, but from the positive grant expressed in the instrument of the union. A quick aside, I used to hear the phrase positive grant when I listened to the late, great Harry Brown's uh, radio show, I guess podcast, we call it today, years and years ago, he always talked about positive grant. And I always wondered, where did he get this phrase? And over the years, I finally learned that I think it really originated from Wilson. It's a positive grant. In other words, there's a grant that's positively listed in the document. That means they can do it. It's totally opposite of how the state constitutions were structured. And that's why he wanted the people to understand that the federal government would not be one of implied or implicit powers. Now, if you listen to my show on Friday, I talked about how Hamilton flipped things around like the flip flopping scam artist that he was. He would say one thing in the ratifying debates to basically back this up. He specifically said anything that is not expressly delegated to the feds are reserved to the states. But then later on, he's like, well, we've got all these applied implied powers and now we need a central bank. But Wilson was very clear here as well, and he was as much of an arch nationalist as Hamilton was, if not more. But I think he was just more of an honest human being than Hamilton who was willing to just change his tune based on what he wanted to accomplish. That should be its own episode. So he's saying, look, this is not from tacit implication. It is through positive grant. In other words, what is not delegated is reserved. And that's what he said in the latter. So in the one hand on the states, he's like, Everything which is not reserved is given. But in the federal situation, everything which is not given is reserved. And that's so very important to understand. Now, Dave goes on. He says, in the run-up to Wilson's speech, those who opposed the Constitution, often deemed anti-federalists, I like how he put that, made central to their opposition the critique that the document lacked a Bill of Rights. That was one of the number one things that they opposed, and that played into what happened in Massachusetts, which helped secure ratification there, where it was already losing in January of 1788. Such an addendum, Dave writes, they argued, was necessary to impose explicit prohibition on the extensive extension of power against the general government. 
Going further, he says, to these charges, Wilson answered that a bill of rights in the context of the system proposed. And that's why he started out saying, like, look, if it hasn't been delegated, they can't do it. And Wilson was making the case that it was unnecessary and redundant. You may have heard at some point that a lot of people argued that a bill of rights wasn't necessary. Well, Wilson explains why. Whether you agree with him or not is another story. I actually do agree with him and think the addition of the bill of rights actually confused things. But... Uh, let's just go with this. Wilson says it would have been superfluous and absurd. Why? Because if it has not been delegated powers to basically infringe on the right to keep and bear arms, for example, it doesn't have that power. There is no implied power to do that. Once you add the Bill of Rights, he was saying, like, once you add this, you're going to create a scenario where you're going to create confusion. He says, in other words, this is what Dave says, in other words, the proposed Constitution only allowed the general government to exercise the powers enumerated. To restrict it from exercise, exercising powers it was never granted in the first place through a Bill of Rights was counterintuitive. Dave goes on, he says, therefore, all powers were explicit in the Constitution's text and those that were undocumented, undocumented powers, there's millions of them, they remained under the jurisdiction of the localities as the people determine in each state, as they determine. No one else has any say on how they're going to do that. This guarantee, though implicit at the time, Dave writes, was eventually made explicit in 1791 by way of the Tenth Amendment. He then goes on to go through uh, rebuttals to a bunch of different things. He talked about trial by jury, uh, standing armies, and actually the structure of the Senate. I'm not going to cover those in any detail here, but you can read his whole speech, which will be linked in the show notes. Then he goes on to this. He says, the next accusation I shall consider is that which represents the federal constitution is not only calculated but designedly framed to reduce the state governments to mere corporations and eventually to annihilate them. A quick aside, the way things have played out, and I think heavily through the doctrine of judicial supremacy, which I covered last week in a different episode. Actually, I covered that last year in an episode on the myth of Marbury versus Madison, but I mentioned it in a series of Supreme Court episodes last week, I think in practice, primarily through centralization of power, through judicial supremacy, incorporation doctrine, and otherwise, additional executive power, all sanctioned by the federal courts, I think it has played out that way. But Wilson didn't think that that was the goal. Now, maybe some people like Hamilton were really actually just selling people on a more federal structure or a somewhat federal structure with a goal of centralizing power later on. I believe that's the case. I don't think Wilson and others really were trying to do that. They actually just thought the checks and balances that, that the people would act as checks and balances against their own government at some point. Unfortunately, we've got a lot of education due to, to do to make that happen. So he's actually, again, talking about how important it is to be concerned about this, the relationship between federal and state power. This is a recurring theme, even amongst the federalists, anti-federalists alike. They all talked about this. Going on, he says, Contrary the, to this claim, Dave says, he noted that the entire constitutional system depended on the primacy of the states. So he's like, look, you're telling us that we're going to destroy the states. Well, there's all parts, there's all kinds of parts in the constitution itself, which require the states to be in charge. For instance, and Dave notes a few of the things. He says the state governments were necessary to amend the document, select senators to fill the upper house. Thank you, 17th amendment. But at least at that time, it was up to the states to make that determination, putting the states in charge, showing that the states were represented in the in the uh, the Senate now, which has become a national body and determine the qualifications for uh, for voting for members of the House of Representatives. The supposition, Dave writes, that the annihilation of the sep separate governments will result from their union was accordingly absurd according to Wilson. Again, it hasn't necessarily played out the way that Wilson wanted it to, but I think the way he described it was how it was intended pretty well. Going further, Dave points out that concluding the speech, Wilson reminded listeners that the Constitution featured an amendment process that would right aspects deemed to be widespread wrongs. And this is how Wilson put it. If there are errors, it should be remembered that the seeds of reformation are sown in the work itself. In other words, look, 
We don't have a perfect document. And if you don't like it, let's look at the positives here. And if you want to make some changes, there are ways to do that. That's it for all time. There are ways to actually change the thing. And I thought that this was actually interesting because just before saying that, this is what Wilson had to say. I will confess indeed that I am not a blind admirer of this plan of government. It was actually pretty rare to hear something so starkly stated. Most people were saying like, look, we're going to get the best that we can get. Uh, there are some things that I'm not on board with, but a lot of people who are either on one side or the other, they either loved it or hated it. Uh, the people who opposed it, opposed it as it stood without amendments, for example. But I think it was very important that he put this out there right at the beginning. The first major, at least according to me, the first major defense of the Constitution that was being proposed for ratification. He says, look, I'm not a blind admirer and we can amend the, amend this thing. So he says, there are certainly some parts of it which if my wish had prevailed would certainly have been altered. Now, that doesn't mean they would have been altered in our direction of more federalism, more liberty. Unfortunately, Wilson was not that guy, but I think this is a great example of pointing out how I think he was genuinely a good person that we could disagree with on these types of issues. He was actually honest about it because as Dave notes, ironically, and all of this came to pass, despite the fact that Wilson was one of the most notorious arch nationalists of his time. You've often heard me talk about Hamilton, Hamilton, who I hated. Uh, we know what they did with him, but Hamilton's gone. Uh, but Wilson, Morris, and others were certainly, Sherman, were big government supporters of their time. And anything that was being proposed, they were pushing for more centralization of power, surprisingly. Um, Madison as well, the so-called father of the Constitution. I've also mentioned over uh, the last couple of years on this show that Wilson might most right might be the right guy to call the father of the Constitution more than Madison in some ways. But during the Ratif Philadelphia Convention that drafted the Constitution, for example, Dave points out, Wilson favored a national referendum to elect the president. National, not a federal structure. He wanted to give the executive an absolute veto over any law passed by Congress. Absolute veto. He wanted to add the power to tax exports. He wanted to permit everlasting inferior courts that could not be dissolved by the legislature. And he wanted to bestow upon Congress the power to and ability to enact mercantile monopolies and charter corporations. On Friday's show, I pointed out that when Jefferson was arguing with Hamilton over the creation of the National Bank, he actually really had a home run on that where he said, like, look, I know what happened at the Philadelphia Convention. I know a lot of people will tell me, well, Jefferson wasn't even there, but it's not like he wasn't aware of what happened. It wasn't communicating with his great friend Madison what was happening and he didn't understand what was going on. But he pointed out, like, look, there was a debate over actually including corporations and everyone rejected it. It was proposed by Madison. It was brought up for a vote and the Philadelphia Convention actually rejected the idea that the federal government could charter a corporation. And so therefore, how can you actually charter a corporation, the first bank of the United States, when we know that the Philadelphia Convention didn't include this power in the Constitution? It was never brought to the people of the several states for ratification. So Wilson was one of those guys who was on board with that kind of power. So Wilson was a guy who wanted far more centralization of power, but he was honest and saying like, look, this is what we ended up with. And he didn't twist the arguments uh, as much as someone like Hamilton did. Summing it up, Dave puts it this way. Despite his own ideological proclivities, Wilson articulated the plain truth that the Constitution was a federal model based on enumerated powers rather than general authority. Again, that goes right to the beginning. That which has not been delegated is reserved. That which is not granted is held back. It has to be clearly in the document for them to actually be able to exercise those express powers. Dave goes on, he says, the framework divided powers not only between federal branches, but also between local and central authorities. And that's an incredibly important point that we try to cover here all the time. That when you're talking about checks and balances, you're not talking about checks and balances only between the branches of the federal government, because then in the end, what you're doing is you're relying on the federal government to police the limit of its own powers and what's going to happen when an organization 
determines the extent of its own powers. That power is always going to grow no matter who's in charge, no matter who's on the Supreme Court, no matter what party is in power, no matter what person is president and all of that stuff. It will always grow. And so there is a role, a very important role for the people of the several states. Dave goes on, he says, rather than divesting general grants of power, provisions within the apparatus were to be the only ones exercised in the first place. Those who ratified, because this was such a popular document, this was so well read and so much understood, and those that were following this, Dickinson's arguments in support of ratification, Tench Cox, also in uh, Pennsylvania, his arguments in support of ratification, these were also widely read, and many of the arguments were based on what Wilson had to say here. Those that ratified then, Dave writes, did so on the basis of these assurances rather than accepting the trepidations of the document's skeptics at face value. I think this is so very interesting. I was really excited to actually do this episode and share this information with you. It was really cool when uh, I had actually set this as an idea to write an article over to uh, Meharry. And I said, hey, if uh, you check and see if Dave or TJ or somebody else wants to do this, I was really excited to see that Dave took it on. And his article really, really knocks it out of the park. I encourage you to read it. It'll be published just after midnight Pacific time tonight. We want to publish it on the anniversary. But I will link to that and the original speech in the show notes so you can read it in full. Uh, just reading through a few of the comments here in the sh in the live chat. I will get back to reading all of them a little bit later, but I'm going to scroll through a few of them. Clay Kent, I'm no fan of Hamilton. I side with Jefferson. Yeah, and Jefferson was a human being and made a lot of mistakes, but if we're talking about the, the general structure, a federal structure, limited delegated powers, Jefferson was very consistent on that. And I think even some of the big government people of the time were very consistent. Madison, for example, I did an episode recently talking about flip-flops between Madison and Hamilton, where Hamilton actually just changed it based on the political climate and what he wanted to accomplish. And when Madison changed his tune, it's because he wanted more in the original document. When he didn't get it, he changed his messaging to fit with what was in the original document of the Constitution. And I think that's pretty much what Wilson did here as well. And to me, I have great respect for that. For people who don't want something, agree to a compromise, and then stick with it rather than trying to be a scam artist politician. Richard Henry Lee, of course, warned us. The great Richard Henry Lee once warned us in Virginia that politics is the science of fraud. And politicians are the greatest scientists. I'm paraphrasing that one. WC says, interesting standpoint regarding the, the Bill of Rights. I think it's very interesting as well. And that was kind of a sticking point. The people who wanted the Bill of Rights uh, absolutely won out. That was the only way they could get ratification. But that is a big deal. Funky euphemism says the problem is the 17th Amendment. It's one of the big ones. Centralization of power always is the problem. And that is the concern. And there are many ways that we've had centralization of power. Maybe I should do a, an episode saying the top ways. And I would think judicial supremacy, uh, judicial supremacy through the idea that the, the Supreme Court or the federal courts are the final authority on everything constitutional makes it into a judicial oligarchy. And then the incorporation doctrine, putting all of the decisions for all the states in the hands of that judicial oligarchy, the 17th Amendment, really gives us a national Senate kind of an aristocracy, an imperial Senate, really, instead of a federal structure where the states are clearly being represented. I'm not sure. It's a, it's definitely a part of it. The Federal Reserve is a huge part of this problem as well. Uh, looking further at some of the chat, Patricia Dance, sorry I'm late, internet trouble. Man, I have had that problem from time to time too, but I appreciate you being here. And looking a little further, further Blue North Wind, good to see you. Melody Skamen said, several minutes of chat just disappeared. I'm not, hopefully there wasn't a problem through the entire system, but uh, I definitely am recording this in the background, so I do upload through a bunch of other platforms if there are any problems with anything else. Melody Skamen says we need to return the Senate to state's advocates, and it's a huge part of the problem. Clay Kent says never, ever trust government. Reason writes over on Periscope, which is cool, Starry Decisis is an assault on originalism. I have been really hammering that message. If you haven't checked it out I, over at 10th Amendment Center .com slash path to liberty. That's the show homepage, not just to be a promoter here, Reason Rights, but if you scroll down, I have a series of categories where I've uh, put some of the primary categories of things that I've covered. 10th Amendment, the Supreme Court. So last week and the week before, I did three to five episodes covering the Supreme Court. And I did some uh, coverage on stare decisis, precedent being more important than the Constitution itself. 
Patricia Dance says YouTube isn't allowing me to hit that like button. Well, those little scammers. Anyways, if you can, that reminds me, if you're able to give it a try, give it a try, smash the like button on YouTube, hit subscribe. If you're on iTunes or Podbean or any other podcast platform, leaving a review helps us out a lot. Leaving comments in the archive are just awesome. All of this stuff triggers the algorithm of the platform and it says, oh, people are doing stuff on the show. We should show it to more people. We have been reaching more and more people every single month. We are growing and we're going to continue to grow. We need to reach millions of people. We're nowhere close, but we're going to continue doing this no matter what, no matter what the odds are. As John Dickinson once put it, Concordia res parve crescunt. It means small things grow great by Concord. He was certainly right as he wrote that in 1768 in the in the years leading up to the secession and the war the revolutionary war and independence and we need to have that mindset today as well and of course if you really want to support us financially you want to put your financial faith behind our work you can absolutely do that you can join a number of people who are already members uh, out in the live chat and i see people here all the time i couldn't be more grateful for you supporting our work Two bucks a month goes a long way. There are other options, five-year, lifetime, and otherwise, if you have more means to be able to do that. Do not feel obligated to join us. I just want you to consider it. If you can, that would be amazing. One way or the other, we're going to continue doing this show for free. We've got over 10,000 articles and blogs on our website that we make available for free, and we're going to keep rocking no matter what in support of the Constitution and Liberty. But I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope you learned something from this. That's the most important. I always learn when I read articles by Benner, and he has a really, really great perspective supporting the original legal meaning of the Constitution, promoting a federal structure rather than the arch nationalist monster state that we live under today. I'll link all that uh, in the show notes at 10 amendmentcentercom slash path to liberty. I hope you had a great weekend. Your Monday is off to a good start, and I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.